new study today in Luke's gospel. I think I still hear music. I don't know if it's... There you go. Thank you. All right, Luke's gospel, chapter 1. And we are going to read verses 1 through 25 together, and then we will jump right in. So we will have the uh, words on the screen for you if you would like them that way. Of course, uh, there are Bibles on the table out in the middle, and if you don't have one with you. And we also have some Bibles out in the bookstore if you need one and don't own one. So Gospel of Luke chapter 1 reads as follows. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word deliver them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth." For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day Uh, these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. As always, we are so grateful that we can read it and hear it and understand it together. And we can do so in your presence because the word was written by your spirit and you have given us of your spirit. And thus the word can make sense to us. We can understand it. And Lord, we ask you to speak this word to us and do so now because your servants are listening. We are grateful to be here in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we start a new book of the Bible, 
I'd like to take a minute and just go through uh, some background in history. And this being one of the Gospels, maybe sort of harmonize the Gospels a bit for you so that as we get into this study, you'll be better equipped to understand the Scriptures. We know that we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, we know, was a Jewish man. He was one of the 12 disciples and apostles. He was a Jew. He was a tax collector. He was a companion to Jesus. And in the Jewish civilization, life was built around the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. The Jews' life was built around worship. When Matthew wrote his gospel, he appealed to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, quoting them 99 times during the course of his writing to convince his people, the Jewish people, that Jesus was the Messiah, the King, the one that God was sending to the earth to be his representative. There's a little bit of debate between Matthew and Mark as to which gospel was written first. Matthew was probably written in the AD 50s to set a timeline for you. Jesus was crucified and died right around AD 33, AD 34. So Matthew's gospel was written some 20 or 25 years later. Mark's gospel. Mark was a companion of Peter. Mark is the person named John Mark. In uh, Acts chapters 13, 14, and 15, he was a cousin to Barnabas, or a nephew to Barnabas, and he later in life became a protege of Peter. Uh, Everyone believes that Mark was sort of the secretary, if you will, who wrote down the gospel from Peter's account. We mentioned how the Jews built built their life, their civilization around the scriptures. The Romans built their civilization around government, power, and action. And when Mark wrote this gospel, Peter gave sort of an account that was fast-moving and fast-hitting. We know that Peter, as he was called as, as a disciple, was a fisherman. And so he was a man of action. Uh, he was not the kind of guy who could sit around and do nothing. He always had to be moving. And so Mark's gospel, or Peter's account of the gospel, emphasized action and and fast-moving actions. And it emphasized the fact that uh, God was a God of action. Uh, So Matthew and Mark have similar things that they cover, but the emphasis was slightly different on the Jewish life in Matthew's gospel and on more of the Roman life and the life that was a life of action in Mark's gospel. And part of this we see in the shortness of Mark's gospel, there was only 16 chapters. When we come to John's gospel, John was the last gospel written He was a Jew and a fisherman. He was a companion of Jesus, and he also knew Peter. When John wrote near the end of the first century, around 85 or 90 AD, this is now close to 60 years after the crucifixion, uh, the church was founded, of course, 50 days after the ascension of Jesus. By this time, the church had been born, and the word had been spread, and churches were growing. But false doctrine began to creep in, and as John wrote, he covered something that the other three Gospels hadn't covered, which was he focused on the deity or the lordship of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus was both God and man. And so as John wrote, he wrote uh, to combat in part this foolishness called Gnosticism, which is something you can look up. We can go through that another time. There's a a bit of explanation behind what that was. But Gnosticism essentially promoted what man thought over the word of God. It promoted man's understanding of who God was. But then Luke's gospel, uh, the third gospel written, written around AD 60, we know that Luke was a physician. He was a companion of Paul. Luke also was not a Jew, he was a Gentile. So he, it turns out, is the only Gentile to actually write a New Testament record. 
Luke came out of Greek civilization and culture, philosophy, wisdom, reason. He was trained in those things. And he also, in addition to having training as a physician, also clearly had organizational skills. In fact, what Luke did as we get into his study in both the book of Luke as well as the book of Acts, he wrote both of those. Luke did more of an investigative journalist approach. He interviewed people. He interviewed many, many people. Presumably, he interviewed all of the apostles he could who were alive at the time. He likely interviewed Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he includes a number of accounts that are not included in any of the other Gospels. Now, when we consider Luke and Paul, they were the two who wrote the most in terms of the New Testament. People wonder who wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know. It's not named. Many believe Paul wrote Hebrews. If Paul did write the book of Hebrews, then he would be the most prolific writer of the New Testament. But if he didn't, and there is question on that, then Luke, by content, has written the greatest amount of content in the New Testament. And in order, it would be Luke, and then Paul, and then John himself. So what is the point here? Paul, in his writings, gave us more doctrine, but Luke's accounts were more important in laying a foundation for faith. Luke outlined the sweeping history of the first 30 years of the church, including the years of Jesus' ministry. Luke gives us a wonderful picture of the compassion of Jesus being a physician. He gave us a picture more so than the other gospel writers of how Jesus ministered to the needs of people. He documents the story of Jesus all the way from the Annunciation of John, which we just read about, to Jesus' ascension. Um, Luke, being a Gentile, puts Gentiles in a favorable light in his gospel more so than the other gospels. Interestingly, Luke's gospel is the one most interested in the roles of women, children, and he looks at social outcasts and the poor more than the other gospel writers. Luke's gospel transcends the first century's neglect of women. We hear women's names more in Luke's gospel than in any other gospel. Mary, Elizabeth, Anna, Martha, her sister Mary, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, the widow of Nain, the widow who gave all she had, the daughters of Jerusalem, the women in Jesus' parables. And he lists them more than any other gospel writer. The gospel of Luke also emphasizes the subject of prayer. Jesus' prayer as well as the prayer of the people. Uh, he has seven direct references to Jesus praying that are found in this gospel alone. Luke's gospel is also the gospel with the most emphasis on the Holy Spirit and on the joy of the Lord. Luke's gospel is also the one with the most emphasis on the good news itself, the gospel. And so Luke's account is going to be a great opportunity for us to draw near to the Lord in the way that God, the Holy Spirit, has used his pen to bring this account of the gospel to us. One of the things we're going to get into here in the very beginning is that the gospel period is coming on the heels of what was known as 400 years of silence. Because when the Old Testament ended with the book of Malachi, God did not speak prophetically for 400 years to his people. And so actually Luke's account, because Luke goes all the way back to the announcement of John, the forerunner of Jesus, what we hear in these first few verses that we've just read is where God himself breaks the 400 years of silence. So it's incredibly important to us to listen to what God speaks after 400 years of silence. In fact, as we get into this, I was thinking about this last night. For many of us, it may have been a while since we've heard God's voice. Now, if you've, been, if you've read his word, you've heard his voice, but sometimes we, 
We need to just know, Lord, am I hearing your voice speaking to me? And if it has been a while since you've heard God's voice, then I just want to let you know today, as we go forward in reading God's word and studying it together, that this is a day when that silence can be broken in your own life. May you and I both hear and heed the voice of the Lord. It would be fair to say as we enter Luke chapter 1 verse 1 that the, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. We just read that back on Wednesday night in our study in the book of 1 Samuel. And that phrase in the Old Testament means that God wasn't speaking much primarily because people didn't want to hear. And that's sad, isn't it? To think that God himself would stop speaking because people don't want to hear what he has to say. And so here in Luke chapter 1 verse 1, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Here's something interesting for us. These first four verses in the original language are written in one sentence. So they are spoken as one theme. They are written in a classical style and even in an academic style, but here's the interesting thing. After these four verses, the rest of it is written in what we would call the common man's language. So he didn't write as a scholar. He opened this up writing to this man, Theophilus, who likely was a wealthy Roman man that Luke had contact with. His name means lover of God. Some have said he's writing to all of the lovers of God out there. And if that's you, then it's written to you. But it also may just be written to this man that Luke himself was attempting to minister to. And some have surmised that because doctors in the first century were not as we understand them today, you call up, make an appointment and go see a doctor. Doctors were more like indentured servants in that period of time. Only the rich had doctors on their staff. And so some believe that this man Theophilus may have released Luke to the Christian faith and to go and to minister with Paul. We see in Luke chapter 16 that Luke's name comes up and he joins the crowd. And of course, Luke is the one who wrote the account of the, gospel, the, uh, the, the book of Luke, excuse me, the book of Luke, the book of Acts. And so as Luke writes this, he says, many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. It could be that others made an attempt to write down the chronicles of Jesus. But Luke wanted to write down an accurate account. He wanted to do the, the, the investigation, the journalism, if you will. It's quite possible that others were not accurate or they had sloppy journalism. And so he wanted to interview those, verse 2, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and delivered them to us. He said he wanted to go talk to those people who knew who were there. It's interesting that John in his epistle, 1 John, said we have seen and heard and touched the Lord. And so no doubt he wanted to talk to those people. The word eyewitnesses, for those of you who have an inquiring mind, is the word from which we derive our word autopsy, meaning personal examination, digging deep. And so when he says that they were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, he's saying, in essence, talking to them, interviewing them, was like doing a verbal autopsy to get the, the word of God on who Jesus was and how he lived. And when he said in verse 3, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the first, he's saying, I was excited to know about Jesus and I had heard about him through, through whatever his contacts were. But by doing this research, he knew more about Jesus. Now, there are many people over the years, even in our own modern times, who were atheists and agnostics and who were really 
vitriolic and anger, angry toward God who set out to prove that Jesus was a fraud. And you know what happened to them? They ended up becoming believers. Josh McDowell uh, is one of them. Uh, the case for faith, I can't remember his name. Uh, Lee Strobel, right? He set out to do the exact same thing, to prove that that was a falsehood. And of course, Lee Strobel today is one of the most prolific apologists. So when you set out to learn about who Jesus is, if you really want to know whether he was truly God or not, I would encourage you, and I'm sure Dr. Luke would encourage you as well, read the book. See what it has to say about who Jesus was. And when he says here in verse 4 that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed, Luke wanted to give an account that was verifiable, that was accurate. He wanted to seal the instruction and make sure that people had an accurate account of who Jesus was. And so in verse 5, he jumps into the story. So he says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So he, as he frames these characters in for us. He's picking up the story back there <clears throat> before the birth of Jesus, and he's talking about these people who seem to have a pretty significant role. There was this man and his wife who were both from a priestly descent. Uh, the division of Abijah of that day was a priesthood organized into 24 divisions, and it was in keeping with the Old Testament law. And it turned out that during this time period, there were about 24,000 priests in Jerusalem, far too many to minister at once. So we'll learn as we get into the story that uh, they drew lots and they got to minister just a, a short time each year. And some of them only got to minister even once in their lives. So to be a priest and to have your ministry very, very limited would be, on the one hand, frustrating. But on the other hand, when your number came up that you could go and minister, it was considered not only a great honor, but you realized that in your life that this was a great privilege and responsibility. We learned that Zacharias' name means Jehovah has remembered, and Elizabeth's name means God is my oath. That will become significant as we go through their story. Verse 6, they were both righteous before God. This doesn't mean they were perfect, but what it meant was they were attempting to the best of their ability to follow the word of God and to live the way he wanted people to live, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. So they were keeping themselves pure and obedient to the Lord, but verse 7, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. This is not the first time we've read in the Bible that a, a woman was barren, that she wasn't able to have children. As we read in our story on Wednesday night in the book of 1 Samuel, we read that the Lord had closed the womb of Hannah. Here, no doubt, as Elizabeth is now a much older lady, She's uh, gone well beyond childbearing years. In fact, the word when it says advanced in years means that they were bent over. They were that old. We're not told what their age was. But at whatever age people start to bend over, then that's how old they were. So let's just assume for the sake of discussion they were in their 80s. I don't know. But as they are you know, have reached this point, maybe they're 90, maybe they're 100, they're well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. I imagine this was an opportunity for him to just go in and draw near to God because in those days, of course, in the temple ministry, the common people couldn't go into the temple to the presence of God, so they had to stay in the outer courts. And so on this day, as uh, he had been uh, received a lot to burn incense, it says he went into the temple to minister to the, 
to the Lord himself. Now let me read something to you here that will explain what's happening. The Mishnah states, which is another extra biblical record, that before each of the two daily services, so there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice, four sets of lots were used to determine the participation. In this case, the incense lot fell to Zechariah, and in an instant he was at the apex of his personal history. The honor of offering incense was the grandest event in all his earthly existence. Many priests never had the privilege of offering incense, and no priest was allowed to do it more than once. Now here was the significance of offering incense. If we go back to the book of Exodus and look how God established the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, there was to, to be a continual burning of incense as there was to be a continual light in the presence of the Lord. And the incense, we are told very clearly, was to symbolize the prayers of the people going up before the Lord himself. So when the priest would go in, what actually happened is three priests would go in and they had three different uh, responsibilities. One priest would carry in on a little plate the incense. One priest would carry in the coals or the fire. They would be on the sides. The middle priest would be the one who was going to burn the incense and offer the prayers. So what would happen is they would go in together and as they went in, the two on each side, the one who was bearing the incense and the one who was bearing the coals would lay them down and basically bow and walk out. And the priest who was there to offer the incense and to pray in the presence of God would be there to, by himself to pray. And he had a specific agenda. There was no uh, written out, you must pray for these things, but they were generally told that they had to go in and pray for the nation and pray for God's presence to be upon his people. And so they had a sort of general guideline of how they should pray going in. This was not the time for them to walk in before God with their list of personal requests. It was a time for them to go in and represent the people before God. So they had a high and a holy responsibility. So this is the setting as Zechariah goes in. And the whole multitude, verse 10, of the people was praying outside at the hour of prayer. And as they would see those three priests go up the steps and walk into the temple, they would enter into prayer outside, praying for him and praying for whatever he prayed for and asking God to bring uh, speed and answers and favor to his people and to his servant as he went in to pray. So they would be outside, face down often with their hands uh, spread out in silent prayer. And they knew at that moment that what was happening is before the Lord God himself, these prayers were being offered. And so as Zechariah was there, ministering by himself, we're told in verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now we know from our reading of scripture that when we see angels appear to people, most often people fall down in fear. Because this is an angel of God, this is... You know, don't think a movie version of, you know, like just some person glowing in white or something. This was an angel. Yes, they had, they had wings and, you know, angels are described to us in various ways and, and often they were frightful sights. And this was a person, this angel, who had been in the presence of God as he tells us here. He says, when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now remember at this very moment, here's what's happening. The 400 years of silence has been broken right now. And the angel said to him, this is it, do not be afraid, Zacharias. Now when an angel says that, it's because you're afraid, which would be a normal response. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, wait a minute. He was in there to pray for the people. But God is saying, I've heard your prayer. I've listened to what you've been praying for for many years, old man. And God has not forgotten. Now, don't miss this point, folks. Many of us have been praying for things for a long time, haven't we? 
the salvation of someone we want to see come to know Christ or, you know, I look at my daughter Rebecca over there. We pray for her every day. We all have things. We have secret things that nobody knows that we pray for, right? And here's the word of the Lord today to us as his people. Don't get discouraged because you've not yet received that answer to your prayer. Keep praying. Keep trusting God. Now, in this case, God obviously has a divine sense of timing about when and why he is answering this prayer for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, it is physically impossible from a human point of view for her to get pregnant, for him to get her pregnant, and for all of those things. I mean, they're old. They're advanced in years. They're bent over. They probably can't even get into the position. But the angel said, don't be afraid. Your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Here's the name John. Jehovah has shown grace. God has been gracious to you. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Not just because you're old and you're having a kid. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. God's hand will be upon him. And he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. That's referring to a Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. In other words, this child is going to be set apart for service unto the Lord the very moment he's born. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. We're going to see a little bit later in our story the very moment that John is filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And so this is, when we read it, it's a very similar story. If you go back and read in uh, the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's very similar to the story of Hannah where she offers up her son Samuel, except she had been praying for a long time. She was waiting for the Lord to do something. She was in the pit of misery, but God brought her a son, and in the moment that he brought her the son, she gave her son to the Lord. She dedicated him to the Lord. And she gave him that same Nazarite vow that he would be committed to serve the Lord all the days of his life. Except here what's happening, the angel is saying this will be his path. In Hannah's account, she was offering it from her side of things. In this account, the angel is saying he will be set apart. He shall be God's man. Verse 16, here will be his ministry. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. What a great ministry. This is going to be the purpose of his life. What a blessed thing. He will also go before him, capital H, referring to the Messiah, Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, note the quote here, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, if we go back to the last time God spoke, 400 years earlier, in Malachi chapter 4, here's what he said. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Do you remember all the way back in the law, God said that children should obey their parents? And remember that in the New Testament, he said many times that parents should love their kids and they should raise their kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Certainly, God is saying here that the breakdown of the family would be the breakdown of society. And this was very important to the Lord that this not happen. And so, as John would come and become this prophet-like character similar to Elijah. He would preach and teach in such a way, and we know, of course, from his story, that he talks about repentance and turning back to the Lord, turning from our wicked ways and turning to God and forsaking our sin, that we might follow God. So the angel here, it would seem, is clearly identifying John as a successor to the Old Testament prophets after 400 years. Jesus later said in his ministry, 
Elijah does come and he will restore all things, but I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So Jesus even refers to John the Baptist as being the one who fulfilled that prophecy from the book of Micah. In verse 18, And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. What he's questioning in this moment is, how could God do this? So he's thinking physically. He's thinking, obviously, she can't have a child. And this this whole process, how's it going to work, Lord? And isn't this just like the questions we so often ask? When we read God's word and he says he's going to do certain things, and we sit there and go, but God, how are you going to do that? Because partly we want to understand, but also partly we don't believe he's able or he's capable. Now later we're going to find out in our story that when a prophecy is also given to Mary and Joseph, Joseph will ask a question in a similar way, but on the surface it will sound the same. But the difference is in Joseph's case, he wasn't questioning the ability of God, he wasn't, you know, speaking in unbelief, he was just asking God simply how it was going to go. In this case, it would seem Zacharias is speaking in unbelief. Because, verse 19, and the angel answered and said, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings, but behold, You will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, meaning until he's born, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So unfortunately for Zacharias, he wouldn't be able to speak. He would still receive the promise. But for nine months, he's not going to be able to speak. This was an interesting perspective someone shared. Zechariah looked at the circumstances first and at what God can do last. We are tempted to think this is logical. But if God is real, there is nothing logical about putting circumstances before God. In other words, we need to learn to take God at his word. If God says he can and he will do something, then we need to trust that he both can and will do it. As opposed to going, well, God, how are you going to do that? My wife's too old. I'm too old. This is a young man's game, raising kids. We can't do this. But God said, you can do it, and you will do it. And you're going to get nine months to think about it. When we do not believe God's promise for our lives, we do not necessarily destroy the promise, but we do destroy our ability to enjoy the promise. You see, God will fulfill his word. And the people waited for Zacharias outside. Now, when the priest went in and they saw the three go in and then the two come out, they knew it would be a certain amount of time. It wasn't like a a timer went off. But let's just say it was 15 or 20 minutes, something like that. But they knew roughly that after a certain passage of time, They were sort of expecting that he would come out. And what would normally happen when the priest who burned the incense and prayed before God for the people, when he would come out, he would come to the steps and the people would arise awaiting to hear the word of the Lord. And he would cite for them the blessing from Numbers chapter 6, which reads as follows. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So as Zacharias came out, they arose expecting to hear that blessing of the Lord upon them. And instead what they got, uh, as the people waited, they marveled that he lingered so long. So he's in there a long time. Something's happening. Must be getting a, a revelation from God. But when he came out in verse 22, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So he's trying to 
learn sign language on the spot and somehow communicate that he did meet with the Lord and the Lord sent an angel to speak to him. But how do you do that? You're playing charades. And how do you do that in, in just a moment? And you're so excited because of what God has spoken to you. And so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. So it just kind of now cuts to the fact that his service is over. They go back to their home. His time of service is over. His lot of service is done. And it says, after those days, his wife conceived and she hid herself five months, saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. You see, for a lady to not be able to bear children in this society was viewed as, in many respects, a curse, or perhaps even the, the judgment of God upon them for something that happened. And so often, isn't that the way we view things when God isn't answering our prayer, or we think things just aren't going well in my life, and it must be because of, of me and my sin, or God doesn't love me, or whatever reasons we come up with. And here she's got an answer. God has finally answered her prayer. And while the discipline of God may be a real thing for you and me, understand this, God loves you. And just like a parent who has to discipline their child when something maybe goes wrong in their life or they don't you know, obey the Lord and they don't follow the Lord, God has not removed his blessing he still loves them. He just has to bring discipline. He has to bring correction. And with correction comes instruction and an opportunity to repent and to get back on the right path and follow him. So for us today, as we are here, and hopefully for us, the silence is broken. May you listen to the voice of God. But don't listen with the intent of discerning, well, if I want to do that and I like it, I'll follow him. And if I don't like it, I won't. Because I can guarantee you in that circumstance, you won't experience his blessings. But if you are willing to listen and to heed his voice and do the right thing and follow the Lord, then God will bless you. But here's where it starts, and you know, I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't put these things together, right? As Gina was speaking, I was thinking about the fact that you know, we prayed for her. She's come to faith in Christ. We prayed for Emma. Hopefully she believed. I believe in my own heart, I believe that she, she believed. I, I hope she did. But until a person comes to the place of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing's going to get right. Things are not going to go right in your life until that happens. I can promise you that. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to have turmoil. Until you come to Christ, until you believe in him, it's, nothing's going to change. I, I don't say that in any kind of a mean or a harsh way. It's just the truth. It's like when you go to the doctor, you're like, I'm just going in for a checkup. Everything should be fine. And they say, you know, look, we, we found a spot here on the x-ray. It doesn't look good. When you get that news, it's like, whoa. But you can beat it if you do these things. And here's where it starts for every human being on the face of the planet. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let the silence be broken. Hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God. Lord, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for this amazing study in the Gospel of Luke, and may our hearts be open to the things that you have for us, Lord. And may we just lay down our pride, our resistance, our kicking against the things of God, and just surrender, capitulate, give in to the Lord. And allow him to come into your life and to begin to change your life and to conform your life to truth, to the goodness of God. Let him change who you are. Let him transform your life to be a person who is respectful and honest and righteous 
and caring and loving. Because, God, we know aside from these things, apart from these things, we're just like everybody else, a world filled with hate and violence, shaking their fist at God, wanting only what seems good for me at the moment. And Lord, when you come into our lives, you change us to understand as we open our eyes and we look around that everybody is in need of a Savior. Everyone is in need of Jesus. Everyone is in need of love and forgiveness and the truth. Lord, please change our hearts. Let it begin with us. Break the silence with us that we might be the conduit for breaking the silence in other people's lives. That others might hear and see and as the scriptures say, taste and see that the Lord is good. We thank you. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand and worship?